Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. podcast. This is Jessica. I will be your host today and I am um, hosting a awesome author who also has red hair and cool glasses even though you can't see because we're not using video for this but uh, I was very ex- I'm always very excited because um, I think I, us redheads need to stick together right? <laughs> absolutely absolutely. This, and, is, this is our yeah. mission. Yeah, and um, her new book um, Sleep No More uh, has a redhead on the cover which was another thing that um got me really excited about this book so welcome um jane and krentz to turn the page how are you great and i think i've seen a pattern here yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um why don't you tell us a little bit about this book um this is a new series correct yes this is the first book in what i'm calling uh, the lost night files And uh, the core of the story is three women show up at an abandoned hotel for a job offer. They walk into the lobby and they don't wake up until the next morning and they've lost a whole night. They have no idea what happened, but they now have psychic powers. They fire up the podcast as a means of finding out what happened to them because nobody believes their story. So there's three women, three stories. Each book stands alone. But there's an overarching mystery that goes through the whole series that will gradually be resolved. And that's that's the story. I, I was kind of interested in the podcast angle simply because it is a way of, it, it, it's the latest version of amateur sleuthing, solving the mystery on your own without the aid of law enforcement. And that's that makes for great, great stories, fun plots. Yeah, for sure. And actually, you answered one of my major questions, which um, because this is this particular story, the female protagonist is um, Palace Llewellyn, and uh, she is joined by Ambrose um, in this particular mystery. Um, But there are two other women who she uh, works on the sleep, the Lost Night podcast with. And I was actually curious if each book is going to focus on a different one because this was very palace and um ambrose centric yes that's exactly how i've set it up i write romantic suspense so each book will be a separate relationship each woman will get her own story um and her own hero but but the core of my stories is always that romantic suspense i like the way the relationship heightens the stakes in the suspense and the suspense heightens the stakes in the relationship and everything moves. And I think everything moves in lockstep. And I think that's pretty much the definition of romantic suspense because it's not a mystery with a romance on the side and it's not a romance with a little mystery on the side. It really is its own genre. Um, and it feels like a very American genre for some reason. It just has, uh, I don't know why particularly, but it strikes me that way. And it's a it's a it's a genre that demands equality between the sexes. I think that's what the real appeal is. Two people have to work together, have to learn to trust each other in order to survive. And um, Palace and Ambrose, they both come into this sort of with some trust issues too. Um, I actually thought that Palace's story was really interesting that she was. She she used her ability to be an interior designer in the beginning. Yeah, I okay. This comes from the fact that one time in my life, I actual well, one time that I was having to decorate our first home, our only the only home we'd ever bought, right? And I did I knew nothing about. I knew the colors I liked, but I had no idea how to go about this. So I hired an interior designer, and it was the best move I could have made. And it gave me a whole insight into that's a whole nother kind of talent. I just don't have it, period. But they can see things in the in a space that once you once they point them out or once they highlight them, it's, you can see it. But I would never have been able to find it. Um, 
And they really have a sense of the energy of a place. And they have a sense of how to build energy or calm it or control energy in a space. And they do it with form, color, light. That's that's to me a talent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that that was that, that that was kind of an interesting angle for her, um, you know, that that was sort of a, a way to sort of harness her ability to make people feel like good in their space. But then like she had sort of a breakup with um, somebody who she worked with. And, you know, so and then the whole last night issue altogether. And then Ambrose also had a breakup. Um, and he's a he's a thriller writer. That's the other thing I thought was really interesting. Did you um do you have like do you like to like like to write other writers? Did you find that a little too meta for yourself or were you just like, no, this is what I want this guy to do? No, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> it's, it's 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 fun to write a character that is a writer. I I have no idea why. <laughs> It's just a way maybe of, of getting things out that there's no other way to get them out. It's maybe it's a, I have no idea what the psychology of it is, but it's fun. And it also um, it, it really fit this character because he's on deadline. He's under pressure from his family. He's not sleeping. In fact, he's hardly sleeping at all. He's got a terrible case of insomnia, which is why he checks into this rather mysterious sleep clinic where he may or may not witness a murder. And that's his story and it's solving that murder that is the first story in this book. Yeah, I like that whole angle, by the way. You know, uh, as somebody who has had insomnia in the past, you really do kind of trust, you don't trust yourself. Um, you learn not to trust yourself. And, you know, there's like this whole world that unfolds where you're wondering if your reactions are natural or if they're part of the whole um, insomnia thing you're wondering if what you're seeing is real or if you were sleepwalking which is sort of something that kind of comes up and it you know kind of um hits the whole thing with Ambrose's past uh, another thing I thought was really interesting when the characters were kind of coming together is um for Pallas uh in order to sort of manifest her ability, she draws. Yes. That it's, was really, really cool. Uh, you know, I know you do a lot of paranormal fiction and paranormal uh, stories. Um, do, do you, like, do you kind of um, read about different people who, um, you know, who say that they have psychic powers or people who kind of move within these spaces to develop your characters? Or do they sort of jump off the page and tell you what they're doing? I pretty much invent them. <laughs> it's, it's, it's most most of the quote unquote psychics out there are frauds. And I just like, yep. no. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, it's funny because I was like sort of, you know, skirting that. And they, because they do kind of talk about that in this particular story, you know, like you're going and you're interviewing these people who claim that they have psychic powers, which is one of the things that um, the women in the last night um, files want, they want to find people who have had this experience as well. But when you're dealing in these spaces, you end up dealing with a lot of people who are either sort of, I don't want to say making it up as they go along, but you know, might not a hundred percent be um, real. They might be frauds yeah. or they might sort of be hyping up their own abilities. And I kind of liked that that was sort of a piece of uh, the puzzle that Ambrose and Palace were trying to figure out. Is what's real and what's not. You know, I think that that's one of the reasons I'm so drawn to using the psychic element in my plots. And, and almost everything I'm writing lately has got a psychic vibe. I like the idea of introducing the uncertainty and maybe a hint that maybe there's madness involved maybe there's delusion involved and can I trust what I see and that's that's a key element in my plots and it, it may partially come out of my love of the gothic the gothic is built on not being able to trust your own what your your own eyes basically it's also built on the idea that the danger is really from within not from without 
And I like working with that too, which is why, and a lot of authors do. That's why we go for small towns, <laughs> islands. <laughs> you know, that's that's the reason that so many books are plotted along those lines is that it gives you that, you know, that you know you're trapped with the danger on this in this small place. And that's part of yeah. part of the fun of plotting these books. Yeah, I can totally see that. And, you know, I, it's um, it gives you kind of a workable um, sandbox, which is sort of cool because, you know, there are nods to some of your other stories and some of your other characters. It's not necessarily, you know, you don't need that to read um, Sleep No More. But at the same time, you know, it's a familiar sandbox um, and hopefully would leave some breadcrumbs for people who want to explore some of your other stories. I think, um, well, a few months ago, my genius editor <laughs> pointed out that what I've created is a Jane verse. And I think ultimately, if you work in the business long enough, that's exactly what happens. There is a universe of your own that you will explore. The Jane verse is the universe of my own. And I think every writer has one. Um, I, if there's aspiring writers out there, I would advise them not to worry about doing something different every time. That's not not where your power comes from and it's not what your readers are going to want. Find your power, find your core story, find your universe and and just explore it and enjoy it. So I am curious, you know, because this was this was so much fun this was just a fun story I like the romance um like I said I I just enjoy anything I enjoy people who explore the idea of paranormal and psychic abilities but with that hint of skepticism because maybe that's a little bit of like myself like I I like to believe that hey maybe some of this stuff is there but I'm also kind of like I consider myself an open-minded skeptic yeah. you know I'm like well maybe but also there's a lot of people who are fraud. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as you were saying before, um, so what, like, first of all, do you read a lot of paranormal fiction? Um, and um, what kind of drew you just to the genre in general? Well, I should clarify, and as I'm sure you're aware, because you're in a librarian, and so you know how uh, with the, with the, the blossoming of the romance genre, there have been various areas of subgenres that have developed. And for people in that genre, the paranormal has come to mean mostly vampires, werewolves, the supernatural. I don't do that. I can enjoy those stories, but I don't write them. So I always say I write with the psychic vibe. And the yeah. psychic thing works for me because it's just one step beyond intuition. It doesn't really require belief in the supernatural. It's one step beyond intuition and everybody thinks they have intuition. Nobody really argues about the subject of intuition. And yet, how would you define it? I mean, how do you define it? And I think the border between what may be true psychic energy and intuition is pretty murky. And that's my play area. <laughs> that's that's the area I, I like to, to jump from. I think it appeals to people because they can make that jump. It's not requiring the huge leap of, of imagination. It's just requiring something that feels almost true, almost true, close enough. Almost everybody's yeah. had some experience they really can't explain. And and all of us have had the, we, in fact, we do it all the time. We judge people by the energy they give off, you know, people the, the kind of energy that just seems to drain you or, or the energy that perks you up. I mean, what is that? That's energy. How else can you define Yeah, that? no, a absolutely. And, you know, like a lot of times you hear about, and I'm sure everybody's kind of experienced that, especially as a woman, um, where you are about to get into an elevator and the other person in the elevator, just, you just look and you're just like, you know what? I'm not getting into an elevator with this person and whether or not that was justified, everybody kind of has had that experience, you know, just something like where they're just, they, they feel like something's just not right. And they're, you know, it makes them want to take the left turn instead of the right turn. So, I, and it's funny because you're right. Um, paranormal romance, 
usually, I, I guess, was sort of vampires and werewolves. Although now I'm wondering, like, is that its own subgenre? Like, I, I mean, like, I, I don't want to say cryptid because cryptids are like Bigfoot, which <laughs> I'm sure there's Bigfoot romance out there. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but it's, um, it's wide umbrella, but yes, but, very yeah. wide umbrella. But yeah, I guess that it is a, it is almost um, a different subgenre of that subgenre. Uh, but it does make sense, and it is very tangible, and I think it does um, sort of fit in that gothic that you were just talking about. I think it fits. It, I think it probably evolved from that. That would be where I would trace the the origins of of my books would be out of the Gothic situation, which was almost always a woman's story. And the romance novel has traditionally been a woman's story, although it's now expanded in, but it's still a lover's story. The story of someone who, what, regardless of gender, that person is taking the risk. And that's the person that you identify with in the book. That's the person you're, you're rooting for all the way through the book. Um, regardless of gender and I think that is that's a gothic story so did you enjoy writing one of the characters versus the others like if you were uh, were you you know when you were writing palace were you more like okay you know these are chapters that came easier to me or did Ambrose come easier or did it sort of take some time for you to hear both of their voices I don't really get rolling in a book for any of the characters until the dialogue. When they start talking to each other, then I get a feel for them. I'm a dialogue driven writer. Um, I think most of us come at it from one angle or the other. Some are brilliant narrative and they and the narrative just creates an incredible atmosphere and sweeps you up into the story. I don't do that. I can't do that. For me, it's all about the dialogue and the repartee, the conversation. And so I can actually enjoy doing the bad guys or the, the villains or the good guys. Um, once I'm in, once I'm into their head and, and speaking from their point of view, it's, I, I enjoy that part a lot. Um. So if you're allowed to say so, who is going to be the protagonist of the next novel or you can't say no no I'm almost finished with I'm writing that book now um, right an author is always about a year ahead of ahead of the head of the story publication um so Talia March will be the next one up and she's she's quite a different character and she's got her own new psychic power which is um she used to be very good at finding things she was a librarian and she did some research uh for a clandestine government agency as librarians sometimes have been wont to do. <laughs> but now she's become very good at finding more than information. She's very good at finding dead bodies. And this is not a talent she really wanted to have. Like she says, I, why didn't I get the talent for winning the lottery? Why do I have to find dead bodies? It's, it's um, kind of the downside of her, her talent. Not that, Very, not that librarians do that, but <laughs> I mean, you know, there are first of all, there are many different types of librarians out there, and I'm sure because I'm always, doing that. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm always learning more about my my uh, what is it every day my um my field every day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, there is a chance that um there are um you know li librarians that that do that. Um, but yeah, no, that's really exciting. And thank you for making a librarian the protagonist, by the way. <laughs> um, that is uh, very, um, I, I always love it. And that's always an instant read for me, by the way. Uh, with, with this particular story, are you, so are you writing others at the same time? Or do you focus like on one part of the Jane verse at once? Like, cause I know, um, you know, you've got a lot going on. Yeah, I, I somehow wound up with three different pen names. And that was not my intention at the start of the career. That was not the plan. There never was a plan, to tell you the truth. Um, when it began to develop that I had three names and I it was always a business reason or because I had to reinvent myself because I had killed off one of those names with bad sales. Those were the, re those were the reasons that drove those three names. Um, and for anybody listening who's wondering what the other two names are, it's Jane Castle. 
which happens to be my birth name. And I managed to sign that away early on in my career and it took 10 years to get it back. Bad contracts, didn't think I needed an agent. Um, and the other name I write under is Amanda Quick. And I invented Amanda Quick when I had, for a while, managed to kill off my Jane Ann Krentz contemporary career. And I decided to try writing historicals and my Amanda Quick name is the name I use for writing historicals. So that's how I ended up with three names. And if there are, again, anybody out there listening, aspiring writers, I do not recommend pen names. <laughs> go back, save yourself, don't go down that road. The problem with pen names is that in this day and age, it's you're gonna have to build a brand under all three names because no, readers will not remember one name to the next. They just don't. I know it will say that on the back of your book. It'll say that on your website. It'll say it on your Facebook page. This is my other name. This is my other name. No, nobody's going to notice. <laughs> so for the sake of the sake of your own sanity, I encourage you to stick with one name. If you do write in three different subgenres, as I do, find another way to identify that on the cover. Because the one advantage I've got is that when people pick up one of my books, they do know which world they're entering. They know that with Jane Ann Krentz, it's going to be a contemporary setting. It, and Amanda Quick will be historical and Jane Castle will give them a futuristic. So that's the advantage. But I I strongly suggest find another way to identify each of your sub-genres. Don't change your name. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually really interesting. Do you have, um, I mean, is there one time period that you really enjoy writing in more than the other or are you just sort of in love with all of them I have found it very refreshing to go from one to the other I think if I I think if I had stuck with one all these years because I've been doing this a while now um I might have gotten tired of I might have run out of stories but but when you jump from one world into a whole nother setting with a whole nother vibe and a whole nother set of plot ideas um it just refreshes you i mean it refreshes me at any rate put it that way so it turned out to be a good thing for my creativity and my own career to to move from the three different worlds that that was the advantage it's given me um but i can tell you right now that not all my readers read all my books that's <laughs> readers are very specific and you see this i'm sure if you do um readers advisory very specific about the worlds they will the fictional landscapes that they want to read about and if they want 19th century sherlock holmes london with fog and and all that that's what they want they don't they don't want 17th century and they don't want 16th century 100 <laughs> percent. and that's i always say um <laughs> the easiest way to see how how specific people read is actually looking at the mystery genre because, as you know, there are British police procedurals and there are American police procedurals. And as I like to say, the way you can tell the difference is because in the British police procedurals, the cops are usually the good guys. That dirty cop story is a very American story. And readers who want that do not want the British version and vice versa. And the same is true, like cozies. People read cozies, don't want serial killers. You know, it's just you know it when you see it and you want that world what kind yeah, of I, what I, what is what do you, what do people when the, when people come to you for readers advisory or or that kind of work um how what's your tactic for steering them in the right direction what's your technique that's oh i'm the, i love this i love when authors interview me so that's a really good question um i think what i like to do is first of all i like to sort of get a um, cross section of what they have read and liked. So, cause if I am going to immediately be the person to be like, this is what I like, they might not like it. I don't want, you know, I, I do. And a lot of the books that I tend to gravitate towards do kind of get a little weird too. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to be immediately recommending possibly, you know, the last thing that was a niche Jessica book, but, you know, I read widely because I'm a librarian and because, you know, especially for the podcast and I like a lot of different things. So I like to, um, there's like the reader's advisory interview, you know, like name, 
you know, name what you like. Sometimes the reader will be like, oh, I like everything. And that's not true. Uh-uh. So then I, ha- I have to say, and I did this with children's. I actually was a children's librarian for a while too. I would say, okay, tell me what you didn't like. And then they will say, oh, and they will immediately tell you, I didn't like this. I don't like this. And I don't like this. And then I'm sitting there with my mental list of cross that out, cross that out, cross that out. Now, at least I know a direction to go in. So it's like you, you can sort of, um, go in different directions you can like because when somebody says i read everything you do not you don't like everything um very true yeah even if you read widely you don't like everything um so sometimes you have to go through the back door and be like what what will you not read like what was the last book you read that you hated and they will go crazy they'll be like i hated xyz and that doesn't necessarily mean that XYZ are bad. It just means I shouldn't recommend books like that to them. <laughs> no, that's a very a good approach to it. I'm I'm always curious to see how readers advisories people because every all of you have to invented your own techniques for fu- getting at the angle. Um, and for people out there listening to this, if you haven't used that kind of resource within your public library, don't hesitate. It's Sometimes you can even do it online. I remember when um, when I was starting out to do the latest incarnation of my Amanda Quick books, which was the 1930s, I couldn't find any romantic suspense of, to speak of in the 1930s. And that, to me, having been in the business a long time, is a red flag. If nobody else is doing it, you do not want to get too deep into this. Um, or know that it's a risk because there may be a reason why it that world has not been used as romantic suspense. It's been his heavily used for suspense um, and psychological suspense, but not romantic suspense. So the first thing I did was I hop online and contact the librarian um, readers advisory via by the computer and it's Seattle public. And I said, tell me who's writing romantic suspense in the, 1930s and they came right back with like two books <laughs> and they weren't really what we would call romantic suspense so at least going in I knew I had a potential problem I was I was I, it, I knew I was taking that risk uh this is my Amanda quick name that I was risking there however what stepped in to fill the void which I had not thought of right away were the movies because the films of that era are often romantic suspense type films and definitely dialogue driven which between two characters and that does fit my voice so so that's what kind of saved me but uh, long story short you can get answers like that from the public library <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and we love that too um ab- <laughs> absolutely yeah that's fa- that's fantastic and i love that that's the route you kind of went for that. Um, just uh, you know, before um, before we wrap up, I'm just curious, what was it about the 1930s that was that red flag? It, it, I I have my thoughts, but I want to hear it from you. <laughs> well, if, it's a very narrow window in history, bracketed by the Great Depression and the onset of World War II. So you're dealing with a small time frame in which a great deal happened and there was a lot going on, especially for women uh, coming out of the home. It was a, it was a real change, time of change for women. I mean, that's Amelia Earhart says it all, you know, that's, that's the iconic image of the 1930s. World War II changed all that. The 1950s were an entirely different period. If World War II had not happened, there's no telling how the women's movement and the role of women in society would have changed. But that's the way it went. So I'm dealing with a very narrow world in which women are coming out of the house, coming out of college, having adventures. Um, This is a very exciting time. And there's a lot going on in science, in uh, technology. Um, The first fax machines, the first TVs, um, flying helicopter, uh, you know, various kinds of of aeronautic developments. Um, And 
a lot of the action was happening on the West Coast, which was so it was overlaid with the whole Hollywood glamour thing, because the West Coast was this mythical place where you could go to reinvent yourself. That setting fits perfectly for my characters because I'm always doing reinvention stories. And so that's how I kind of wound up in the 1930s. Um, but I, but looking back, I have to say it was probably the films of that era that drew me in first. Even and the thing about the 1930s is that even though I didn't live then, I know the I know so much about the because of the films. We they become iconics. Yeah, so. absolutely. As a film theory person who then became a librarian, yes, I agree. Um, absolutely. Uh, there's just so much to be said for that. Well. I uh, thank you so much. This is really cool. Please come back and talk about more of your books, about your next book. Does your next one um, ha in the um, Lost Night Files, does it have a title yet or you cannot reveal? Yep, it's called The Night Island. Ooh, I like it. Very <laughs> cool. <laughs> thank you. Well, this was really nice. Um, I know that Sleep No More is going to be an instant borrow for a lot of people here uh, because we're always getting requests for your books. Great. Um, I hope they enjoy it. Yes. And I, I know they will. And um, I want to thank you once again, um, Jane Ann Krenz, for coming um, and chatting about this and about other things, too. Uh, I always love it when, when our um, interviews kind of take a left turn. And we discuss, you know, a few other things about the process, because I think that that's sort of an important way of getting to know the authors that write the books that you love. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's been great. I'll look forward to another chat one of these days. Excellent. So once again, this was Jessica with Syosset Library's Turn the Page podcast. Our guest today was... That's Jane right. Akritz. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.